Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming to the Brooklyn Museum. My name is Cora Michael. I'm associate curator of exhibitions here and also the organizing curator of this place, which presents Israel and the West Bank through the eyes of 12 international photographers. This monumental, ambitious art project was spearheaded by artist Frederick Brenner, who I am very pleased and honored to welcome tonight in the first of a series of four programs pairing artists with writers and historians. Frederick will be in conversation with the best-selling novelist Nicole Krauss as together they discuss identity, otherness, longing, belonging, and exclusion, and the ways in which fiction and photography approach storytelling, character, and metaphor. Born in Paris, Brenner studied French literature and social anthropology at the Sorbonne. He began photographing at the age of 19 as he set out to capture the ultra-Orthodox Jewish community in Jerusalem's Meisherim neighborhood. From there, Brenner, Brenner broadened his examination of portable Jewish identity to include the entire world, a project that culminated in the publication Diaspora, Homelands and Exile, which was also a major exhibition, which I'm proud to say we hosted here at the Brooklyn Museum in 2003. Brenner was not only the initiator of this place, but he also participated in the project as a photographer. His work from Israel and the West Bank, which is collected in a, in a monograph entitled An Archaeology of Fear and Desire, represents an attempt to examine Israel as place and metaphor and to look anew at a territory where, quote, the maps of the sacred overlap, compete, and ultimately exclude each other. Brenner's images address the myths and fantasies that construct individual identity, but which serve ultimately to alienate us from each other and from our own humanity. Nicole Krauss has been hailed by the New York Times as one of, the, of America's most important novelists. She is the author of the international bestsellers Great House, which was a finalist for the National Book Award and the Orange Prize, and The History of Love, which won the Sarian Prize for International Literature and France's Prix du Meilleur Livre Étranger, and was shortlisted for the Orange, Médicis, and Femina Prizes. Her first novel, Man Walks Into a Room, was a finalist for the Los Angeles Times Book of the Year. In 2007, she was selected as one of Granta's best young American novelists, and in 2010, chosen by The New Yorker for their 20 under 40 list. Her fiction has been published in The New Yorker, Harper's, Esquire, and Best American Short Stories, and her books have been translated into more than 35 languages. The History of Love is being made into a major motion picture, which will be, which will be released in, tw in 2016. Please join me in welcoming Frederick Brenner and Nicole Krauss. So I'm very happy to be here tonight speaking with Frederick, who I only just met recently. Um, but in a sense, it makes, it's, it makes absolute perfect sense that the two of us should be in conversation, I think, about this work. Because it seems to me that we're both clawing in our work towards similar ideas, um, or at least driven by sim a similar um, curiosity about um, our, our identity. So I, I am, I don't, I've never spoken much about photography, but I have spoken a lot about storytelling, and I think a lot about storytelling, as do you. Um, and I really think today we're here as two storytellers, and two Jews who are raised in diaspora, who in our examination of the diaspora have found ourselves inevitably drawn back over and over to the source and the story, or many stories, both ancient and contemporary, of Israel itself. So if the story were simply linear, it would be a lot easier to tell, I think, and maybe it would interest us a lot less. Um, if the story were simply the reverberations of 2,000 years of exile and the tracing of fragments back to a lost original whole, or if the story were simply circular, um, if Jewish existence exploded into so many shards had been fully gathered back into its original vessel, that too would, I think, be an easier story to tell. Um, but it's neither and it's both. And the story doubles back over itself so many times that the effect is often dizzying. I think of your first project, um, which, which you speak of as the kind of origin of 35 years of subsequent work, um, was an exploration of Meir Sharim, a neighborhood in Jerusalem of ultra-Orthodox Jews recreating the diaspora within Israel. 
So one um, element of the doubling effect is that you and I are both, in effect, storytellers exploring a people whose very existence in the absence of a certain physical reality, a nation and a land, has depended on their ability to maintain and transmit a highly complex identity through the centrality of text. And part of the magic of that to me is that the very early, early Jewish discovery of the ways in which these texts designed to remind us of who we are and where we came from also provide an enormous opportunity for self-invention. So one could say that the reason we continue to live, or some of us try to live, on this contested scrap of land today is actually because of a story which we began to write about ourselves in that place more than two millennia ago. So in the 8th century BC, Israel was actually, does anyone want to turn off their phone? Um, in the 8th century BC, Israel was actually nothing. It was a backwater nation compared to the neighboring empires of Egypt or Mesopotamia. And that's, I think, what we would have remained forgotten with the Philistines and the Sea Peoples, except that we began to write. So the, the very earliest Hebrew writing we found dates to the 10th century BC, around the time of King David. And they, those were just really simple inscriptions on buildings, really just record keeping. But within a couple of hundred years, something really extraordinary happened. And by the 8th century BC, the Jews were composing the Torah. So we like to think of ourselves as the inventors of monotheism, but actually we didn't really invent the idea of a single God. We only really wrote our story of our struggle to remain true to him. And in doing so, we actually invented ourselves. We gave ourselves a past, and we inscribed ourselves into the future. So in a sense, when, when you think about it, it can sound a little bit like Jewish public relations. Um, <laughs> but, but actually what we're talking about is much larger than perception. It's really the idea of self-invention. So when the Jews began to compose the central text on which their identity could be founded, they were enacting a will and consciously defining themselves, actually inventing themselves, as I think no one had before. And a measure of the success of that story is its centrality in simply every aspect of Western culture. So one might argue that the modern state of Israel is the culmination of the Jewish people's instinct to invent and reinvent themselves. It's a place that's riddled with the conflicts born of a, maybe a confusion between the creation of something new and the recreation of something lost. It's a place that both promised, uh, promised both the creation of a new identity according to Zionist ideals and the recreation of a lost past. So I wanted to start with the title of this project, this place in Hebrew, Makom Zeh. Um, to, it's resoundingly physical. This place here, the ground beneath us, in this world and no other. And it is, in the language of Jewish thought, profoundly metaphysical and spiritual, because echoed in makom ze is hamakom, which is the place, which is one of the ways that Jews refer to God. He is the place of the world, but the world is not his place. Because according to Jewish mysticism, God, the infinite Ein Sof, had to withdraw himself creating an empty space for the existence of a finite world. So to me, the title you chose reverberates with the complications of a place that is at once physical and spiritual, a presence built out of an absence, a here that holds the echo of there, a reference to the singular that holds within it the presence of a great plurality. So I wanted to know how you arrived at the name and whether it was there from the beginning. Thank you. Thank you for this beautiful introduction. Uh, the name was not here from the beginning. It's exactly the reason why we ultimately choose this name. The project started with uh, a kind of uh, title of a work in progress. So it's, it was called Israel, Portrait of a Work in Progress. Mm. And the title, which was provisory, remained, uh, you know, four years later, five years later, we were still with this title. And uh, on one side, I was concerned, and we were concerned that um, the word Israel would not really be inscribing the title, because I wanted to, I wanted to unplug the possibility that our oh, people will mistake the project for what it is not. 
And so we gathered and we had a first reunion uh, trying to see what kind of title. And we came, you know, 12 photographers to decide of one title. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point, I, uh, some people like the, uh, an archaeology of fear and desire, I had sort of also another title, The Land I Will Give You to See as the title, uh, An Archaeology of Fear and Desire as a subtitle. And then uh, during this reunion, we came with the title Seam. Mm. Uh, you think of the Museum of the Seam, right? Yes, yeah. exactly. And so, and we kind of, uh, we all agreed. And then a few months later, uh, one of our curators who traveled uh, around the land said, you know, everywhere people, when they mention uh, Israel, they use, I mean, they use this place. And what is very interesting mm -hmm. in Israel is when people's, people speak with euphemisms, uh, so they never speak about the conflict. They say, amatsav, uh, the situation. And this is part of the denial that you need in order to wake up in the morning and face uh, this uh, unbearably dissonance and complex reality. And so we sort of it and uh, say, well, this place, this place. And then, of course, this place is Makom uh, in Hebrew, which is almost the same in uh, Mekum in, uh, in Arabic. Mm. And then we kind of work out a logo where you could have the three alphabets. Uh, because, again, from the beginning, I wanted this project to be an ecumenical project uh, because Israel is really the place where the particular and the universal meet. Mm -hmm. And so we ended up with this place. Mm -hmm. um, you said that the beginning of any project is always about wrestling, um, which is also a very Jewish concept, I think, <laughs> wrestling with everything you could possibly think of to wrestle with. Um, what is this, and you said that um, the wrestling for you has to do, what is the story I really want to tell, and how am I going to tell it? The first photograph that you took for this project, or what you call the first photograph, I don't know if chronologically it actually was, um, was of the Palace Hotel, and I think that I can do this and it will come up. Um, you've spoken a lot about this photograph as being the key to, your, to, the, to the rest of the work in this project. Um, and you told me about the day that you were scouting for locations for some of the other photographers, um, which required an enormous amount of time and effort, and we can talk about that later. Um, and you saw this. Um, this is actually, I mean, this is the, the facade of a hotel. This is sort of the back of it, right? So you sort of saw this construction site through the, the inside. The inside, through yes. the kind of open door. You saw the trucks going out. You went in, and you were drawn to it. And initially, you thought of it as something that you could give maybe to Thomas Struth or one of the other photographers who more often work with um, architecture. And, and your assistant said, why would you give this away? Why are you going to give it away? This is you know, for you. Um, was it a moment when you understood something about what story you wanted to tell? Or did the Palace Hotel suggest to you a way that you could tell the story? I think that uh, this process is very intuitive. I didn't know what I was doing while being attracted by this place. I never photographed architecture before. I mean, I look at it, I enjoy it, but mm -hmm. I kind of, uh, the working hypothesis that I had uh, carved over a period of uh, uh, a year meeting with the potential uh, artists who were joining the project and uh, the people who funded the project brought me to a kind of uh, uh, idea of the portrait I wanted to, to create. Uh, but I ended up taking a photograph of this, of this uh, very, you know, of this, uh, I don't know, of this uh, facade which seems to be maintained with forceps and a kind of coliseum. It's only much, much later that I understood why this photograph was important. It was important because uh, up until now, I had only photographed in black and white. Uh, I made one photograph in color in my entire 25 years journey. And, um, 
And so, and I didn't know at that time when I started the project whether I would photograph in black and white and in color. I mean, the, the working hypothesis take a long time. I'm first nesting, and then I'm kind of building a scaffold, and then, then I have to jump. But it was, would I use a medium format, a, a regular format, digital, large format, color, black and white, and slowly, slowly you narrow down, you know, uh, what you want to do. And then this photograph obliged me to jump, but I, I, didn't, I never thought that I would use this photograph. I took this photograph, and after I took this photograph, I was at least 70% sure that it would be a color project. Uh, I, I took some black and white of this photograph, uh, but retrospectively, uh, I decided not only to use this photograph, this photograph opened the book before even the book starts. It's the kind of key which helps, which should help uh, each viewer to decipher each other image which is in the book. And so it's a very important image, and maybe when you see the other images, you will understand better. I don't know, I'm gonna push you a little further, if you don't mind, because I've yes, heard this you, is the only, I've, this I've is the only interest that, of this okay, uh, encounter. Okay, I've heard you say that quite a few times, but um, we talked about this photograph together, but I, I don't know that, I, that you ever articulated the nature of that key. So when I, if I look at this photograph, one of the things that I, I'm struck by is the monumental quality of it, but its fragility, the fragility of this place and the enormous, overwhelming effort to hold up something which probably should have been allowed to fall into, finalize its ruined state, right? So these endless girders um, and, and the hollow quality of something that we are looking at from the inside, and we can only imagine what the view is from the outside. We know that, but there's enormous effort from back here to hold this place up. Um, and, and there's something um, a little disturbing about it, um, about, the, about this sort of hollow, empty space. But I don't know if I'm getting at something of the key that you are e describing or, or not, but maybe you could be, you could be more literal. Yeah, it's that. interesting. I mean, uh, my English is very, uh, is very French, very approximate. So it's, uh, but the other day I didn't know the word tenuous in, uh, in English. And I asked what tenuous is about. Mm -hmm. And we've been speaking, uh, Matt Brogan, who helped me to pull this project together. And uh, what I would say, to hold it together uh, with 12 very strong personalities. Uh, which is all, both about uh, a metaphor for the project and for this place. And I think that in this photograph there are opposites. I mean, what is difficult about this place is that there are all the contraries, all the oppositions are here. And this photograph, in a way, summarizes that. But I would say it's only the, the reading that I have today. Uh, I uh, love poetry and I love particularly one... Uh, uh, one poet uh, that I keep quoting, uh, Pessoa, uh, who, uh, and when I made this photograph, I didn't, I didn't know that exactly, but I wanted to use a quote in my book. Uh, I wanted to use many quotes as an epigraph. My publisher only allowed it me to have one. Uh, Pessoa, in his book of Disquieted, say, we are shadows made of flies, both hollow in the inside and in the outside. And this is very much what this photograph for me speaks about. And then, when you'll see the other photograph, it's all about the roles that we take on, all identity as a fiction, mm -hmm. and the fiction of identity. Mm -hmm. And this photograph is here to remind us of that. Yeah. So in this way, this mm -hmm. photograph is the key to decipher uh, the rest, which are just about human landscape and, um, and human landscape and landscape and the mm -hmm. correspondence between one and the other. Mm -hmm. It's interesting. I thought about that Pessoa quote a lot. And it's beautiful, but there's an, the other way to talk about that lie is what I was referring to in the beginning of this talk, which is 
self-creation or self-invention. And it's a fine line between the lie of who we are and the invention of who we are. Um, I think, again, I mean, this is, this is a, a, a work, both your work and the other 11 photographers' work is, are not only about is Jewish existence, they're about all the many existences, the many radical existences of otherness. But I, from, from my own writing and my own perspective, I go back to sort of the, the Jewish element of this. And there I would say that the, our, you know, our entire existence, according to Pessoa, is a kind of lie, which is to say that we, from the beginning, we, we really, we, we fashioned ourselves. I would say it is a lie when we mistake the invention for what it is not, when we forget that our identities are, our identities are invented. Right. And then it's a lie. But if not, it's exactly what you say, a thin line between invention and lies. Right. But then when we worship those inventions, uh, we forget that they are inventions. Then this is what we call, you know, avodazara or uh, fetishism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and Israel uh, offers so many examples. Right. Uh, Moshe Halbertal was one of the uh, person who uh, met with each of the photographers uh, speak of, you know, Jerusalem as the ultimate place of uh, idol worshipping and fetishism. Mm. I once had the pleasure of being taught Talmud by Moshe Halbertal. Only one session, so I didn't get very far. But he's a great teacher. Um, so you're... Oh, I, I, you can push me further. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, I, 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 I take I, a last word on that, which is I think I take a certain kind, I find there's something to be very moving about this power, not, I don't see it as lying per se, but this power to, um, to sort of write ourselves or, you know, decide how we are portrayed and then to somehow live that story, and I, and I think that there is, we are endlessly finding ways to escape out of the story which we have closed around ourselves, you know, so this is a hopeful way of looking, maybe an overly American way of looking, a hopeful way of looking at it, but I do think that there's some sense in which, you know, we'll talk about this later in your work, although there are, there, one feels the, the quality everywhere in Israel, in your work, in the other part of entrapment, there is also, because of the, of, the long history of esca escaping into the next and the next and the next. I think there's also something, there's some hopefulness um, about it as well. Um, I want to talk about the specific title of your, of, of your body of work within this project, An Archaeology of Fear and Desire. Um, I think that the element of desire in, in um, Israel and the West Bank all of it, the longing and the yearning, that to me seems very obvious. But I wonder um, if you could talk more about the element of fear. For me, fear uh, prevail on desire. Much of the desire is created within the fear. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but I would say it's, uh, it's always about uh, wrestling. Many, I, I would use another couple, you know, fear and desire, wrestling and embracing. Mm. And uh, this is what happened in this land uh, all the time, everywhere, with, between everybody and within everybody. Mm. Mm. And that's what I'm trying to, that's what touched me. Mm. Uh, and also in terms of, you know, opposite, this incredible tenderness that you find in Israel and this incredible violence, mm -hmm. and how the two are always together, always interwoven. Mm. Did you find, I think of that, those tensions between those, that, that tension for me is part of what continually draws me to want to write about, not just Israel, but Israelis. Um, and I, there's something about the, um, the way in which they, all boundaries feel dissolved when you are um, um, amongst them, that you feel that uh, so close to the rawness of, of life. And the, the, but, but it's in some ways, it's a little bit um, misleading because part of that comes from um, a kind of um, the protectiveness, the fear of perhaps the other. So there's a need to, the, the assertion of the self, the assertion of opinion. No, you can't find a more opinionated people um, than this small scrap of lands filled with them. Um, but there's something to me that is um, endlessly fascinating about being among 
um, that. And I wonder whether in taking, whether you found that taking pictures, after taking pictures of Jews all over the world, whether there was something different about photographing Israelis in that sort of the brutal frankness or directness um, or, or not? Yes, I think what is remarkable about Israel is that things come out. Uh, reality is more raw, uh, more naked. Uh, and I would say even in my work, it's more naked that, than it was in diaspora. In diaspora, I worked a lot with metaphors. Here, I'm much more in what I would call the pshat, uh, the first meaning. There are four levels of meaning. Pshat, remez, so, I mean, and, uh, and here, it's, my photographs are more, you know, s much simpler also. Mm -hmm. Simpler in the, the, in the sense, you know, simplicity being the complexity resolved. Mm -hmm. But there are all those layers of, uh, and I would say I, the, the difficult exercise for any photograph is to, uh, to really do a lot of field work, not to try to impose my reality, but to let something emerge, and then to try to multi-layer mm -hmm. the photograph, mm -hmm. and then to construct it as multi-layer as possible, and then to deconstruct it, and to get to a kind of such simple expression where everything is here. How do you do that in a moment of taking a photograph of a subject that you only have a short amount of time with? Because I, uh, I do spend a lot of time talking with them. Um, you know, the closer you get the, to people, the more intimate you are. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and try, I mean, a lot of observation. As much, it's, both, it's, both, it's both listening as much as seeing for me. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it is translating in an act of seeing and uh, recording. But it is both uh, listening and seeing. Mm -hmm. um, your, your sense of Israel and the West Bank is a place of radical otherness, um, a place where one identity can exist without being questioned or opposed by another identity, um, and the tension of the opposing forces rubbing up against each other. So, in order to really portray or examine that, you felt that you wanted to add another layer of otherness and to invite the outside gaze of what ended up being 11 other photographers to um, contribute to this project. And I'm wondering, given that this is a, a place and a subject that you've spent so much of your artistic life thinking about, how difficult or perhaps how easy was it for you to, in a sense, give up control of the subject or the story um, and to allow it to be told mm, by other people who, who, with whom you might not share an, the, perspective, the same perspective? I think that uh, I initiated this project maybe with a secret desire to ultimately surrender and trust and I told every single photographer when, before even we started, that each person which will join the project will definitely grow artistically, intellectually, and emotionally. And if it is true, it's true for me. And the great, uh, the great uh, blessing for me has been to wrestle from the very beginning, before the very beginning, and slowly to be able to embrace, and to embrace precisely alterity, otherness, the unknown. Mm -hmm. And it was a very big journey for me, mm -hmm. <laughs> because it was really a carte blanche given to all the photographers. And the photographers were concerned at the beginning that, you know, the, uh, w whenever you hear Israel, you hear propaganda. So uh, those people were legitimately uh, afraid to maybe be instrumentalized. Mm. And uh, so it took like about eight, eight months to a year for people to really be convinced that it was indeed, indeed a in, genuine invitation and an opportunity for them to keep 
pulling the red thread of their own oeuvre. Um, so that, uh, but it, it was difficult. But uh, eventually I started to embrace, and that's incredible. How, what did you offer them? I mean, when, when they came, how did you create a platform from which they could look at this place without, um, so to speak, giving them leading questions? Um, very, very difficult. Slowly, I would say the project. I had intended to be a little more uh, directif than I was, than I became, mm -hmm. and uh, but uh, the first mission taught me a big lesson, uh, and and I then decided rather than to have different guides to really open the project to all kind of actors of uh, Israeli society, from, uh, from architect to psychoanalyst, from uh, social workers to archeologists, plural. And, uh, and I decided to enable those artists to travel first during their exploratory missions, which took about two weeks, through the largest possible spectrum of narratives to get those people totally confused, but on a very high level. <laughs> and out of this you know, vacuum that they were facing, uh, they were able to uh, define what they wanted to do, and then later on, what would be the vectors of the portrait they would like to draw. Mm -hmm. And were there photographers that you invited initially that in the end you felt were not right for the project? Or were there things that you wanted to keep out of the project? Or were you simply open to anything and everything? At the beginning I was open to everything, but I had said that I knew that one thing would disqualify a photographer, uh, which is anger. Anger is always looking for a prey, and uh, Israel, the West Bank, is the easiest, is the most incredible field for enabling that to happen. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so th those and some people took the, uh, went on an exploratory mission and eventually didn't take part in the in the project. Mm -hmm. I had the the great luck of um, being able to go to Israel um, with with a guide that. Um, Frederick had handpicked for one of the photographers, Jung Jin Lee, um, and that was a kind of remarkable experience. This is a, a young woman who took me out to the desert, which I'm interested in um, right now. I'm writing about it in my own novel, The Judean Desert and the Negev. Um, and she told me a sort of wonderful story about how you had found her and interviewed her, um, to, which I assume you must have done 11 times over for each of these photographers, not to mention all the other people you found to help them. I mean, a, 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 it must have been a massive operation. Yeah, and I, un I interviewed 30 uh, potential assistants that were already uh, recommended by another screening from the director of the School of Betzalel, the art school, the School of Photography. Right, and well, Galit told me the story that you, um, you had called her up and said, well, I'd like to know whether this might work. I, I, why don't you show me something or some place that you like? And this, this was the test to find out whether, whether this was, some, I guess, somebody who could um, play the role of um, bringing these photographers into this place without, without directing them overly, but being able to put, just put them in the way of the right accidents, you know? And, and she said that you, you had come to her city and that she had decided simply to take you to the beach, which, and yes. at first you were, put, put, at first you were almost put off. Why did you take me here? But slowly you began to look and you began to understand. And I think you made a great choice by hiring her. She was remarkable. And yeah, and that was, a, I mean, this, I think that's one of my greatest accomplishments in this project. The fact, the way I was able to team together. Uh, two great human beings. And those people became real couples. I mean, mm -hmm. Junjing and Galit, or Joseph Kudelka and Gilad. And, uh, and while it was obvious that those to be photographers, you know, who knew, I mean, who had studied in their uh, book of photography, you know, Thomas Truss or other photographers. Uh, but what was admirable is that eventually the photographers learn a lot from their assistant. And up until today, mm -hmm. they are 
in contact and they some work for some of the other photographers mm -hmm. but i it was a very, it was a big uh, investment in terms of time since i wanted to really see what the, what those people that i was hiring were having in their belly mm -hmm. what kind of uh, because the entire idea was to, to open a non dual perspective to try to look beyond the political narrative and it was important for me to see if those people had this large perspective. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so we can talk about the work of the other photographers endlessly, but it really, I think, tonight is about your work. Um, I'd like to show another one of your photographs. Um, this is, you sometimes refer to as the second photograph yes, of the project. Yes, it is, it is indeed the second photograph uh, chronologically that I chronologically, took. Chronologically, and um, the story you told me is of being exhausted one night and of your partner having been invited to this Shabbat dinner at the family of the, the home of the Weinfeld family. And it was the very last thing that you wanted to do. And somehow you were convinced to go. And when you entered into this family home, you were really overcome by this, the sight um, of this really impressive, very dignified, Orthodox family. I, I wondered, thinking back um, to your early work from when you were 19, where it all began, what you saw in them, um, or perhaps how you could portray them, that suggested you something different and new to say about an ultra-Orthodox recreation of the diaspora in Israel, um, a story that was maybe other than the one you told in your first project in Mea Again, I would say the first two photographs were so improbable. I mean, to photograph architecture, and there was one thing I was sure I would not deal with, is this kind of neo-Hasidism, I mean, the orthodoxy, because I had spent, uh, when I was between 19 and 21, I did a, a, a mono, I, I, photo, I photographed in Mea Shearim, over a period of three years, the ultra-orthodox ultra neighborhood of Jerusalem, and, you know, this recreation of a shtetl in the heart of Jerusalem, in the heart of the Middle East. And I was not likely to go myself, I mean, to go again. This was done. And entering this, uh, this room, seeing this extraordinary table and the family around the table, <laughs> I had say, I need to make a photograph of that. It was Friday night, so I met with them later. I just managed to convince them to take part in my project. And, uh, and, and with this photograph, I knew the project would be only in color. So it's another thing. And, uh, but I was already very aware that it was already one more layer than what I had done 25 years earlier. It was really what I was photographing was a residual of diaspora in the heart of the Middle East. This family could be in New York or in Antwerpen. And uh, so, but, and for me, this photograph is really, I, when, I, when I decided to do it, I say, this is the dream already dreamt. What is, uh, so, but it's an important photo, uh, and eventually, Yes, it's, it became a, a, an important photograph for me. Mm -hmm. it, it feels um, so, it feels so painterly. And there's something, I mean, it could be a Vermeer. There's something of, of a kind of Dutch 17th century painting in this. Um, and it feels so, when you look at it, it feels so perfectly choreographed down to the footwork um, of the boy. And I wondered to what degree these Portraits are choreographed, and to what degree they are, and you know, an accidental. I know it's some of both, but maybe you can actually just t sort of tell us the story of this, the moment in which you photographed them, and how they came into this formation, and what you asked them to change, and what you yeah. didn't ask them to change. I mean, photography is a collaborative and performative process. I always describe myself as a midwife for the people that I photograph, as well as they are a midwife for me. And uh, I'm doing that just to learn more. Uh, and uh, so I, co but I always choreograph it with them. Basically they sat where they sit usually 
on you know Friday night, and I decided to do it on a Friday, so the table would be dressé, shulchan aruch, and uh, and then the magic happened. And the, the more people you have in a in a family portrait, the more difficult it is because you have to lift those ten people, and it must be one breathing all together. And I photograph with a large format, so you can only have. 20 photographs maximum. You know, you put the cassette, you do one, two, and you have children, so it's very difficult how they will not move and that, but the moving is also, you need to take advantage of everything. Uh, and uh, what, I, what I love are, of course, what I discover is the kind of ballet with the feet of each person and the feet of the table. And, you know, the, I mean, I was prompted to make this photograph uh, because the, one of the daughter was getting married, so there would be one less person around the table. And it was good that I did that, because then, of course, each photograph that I add start to draw the contour of the portrait that I want to create. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how you began by doc using the camera to document, but in then move to making art with it. I mean, to what degree? I mean, where, where is the line between where you are documenting this family, but where you are also inventing a story about them that may not be the story that they would tell? Maybe in this image, but perhaps there are other images where, they where it wouldn't be the story. And to what degree does that tension feed the work for you? Do you feel, how much do you feel it? This is this tension that you're talking about. And I would say, the more I accept and embrace my own subjectivity, uh, the more the work becomes really a work which speaks far beyond me. Mm. And that's, that's what I try to find each, I mean, in each photograph. Mm. Do you fear, I'm thinking, the, not this photo, we'll just move forward. In this photograph, for example, is there any, I remember when you spoke to me about it, you said that this was just, you know, an example of taking, what, what did you say exactly, of taking... Um, ja to, uh, this photograph for me is really uh, about how, uh, how people have uh, mistaken the text, the, I mean the book, our book, the Bible, for a book of geography. For, for a book of geography. And so I wonder, in that sense, you have your own sense of how of the of the choices that this man, the, of the patriarch of this family, has made, and yeah. about their lives. And yet, you also have to you are, you must be open to them and how they see themselves. And 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 to what to, to what degree do you worry, or have you had the experience of? Someone you photographed later, looking at it and saying, "This is not. This is actually. This I don't like. What what you, what you've what you've I, seen here. I tell or what you you've made here." I tell you something again. Uh, a photograph is a journey, and I know only after having spent. At first, there's an intuition. I meet the people, and then I spend a lot of time with them, uh, and then I have a feeling of where I want to take them. But I know that the place where they would lead them, where they will lead me to, is a far better place than the place where I thought I would lead them. So it's a kind of conversation, it's a kind of dance uh, together. And uh, for example, for this family, I met them um, at an earlier stage because I knew uh, a professor at Bet Salel who was teaching photography, whose wife is a midwife, a true midwife, not like me, uh, a midwife for, uh, uh, for orthodox women uh, who live in settlements. They're such a narrow niche like that. And she basically performed about 60, uh, you say delivery in English? Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and so she took me to this, uh, to this family. And it was like, you know, the landscape is exactly the same it was 2,000 years ago, and he really has a flock. And uh, I spent a lot of time with them. I went back, you know, they, they are four brothers, and they, they study at Sriok. They wake up very early, they study the Zohar together, etc. And, 
and I went with him, you know, in the morning when he was taking his flock out, and, and I thought, yes, I should really have a photograph with, with them. And, uh, and so, because of the light, I decided to do it late in the day, and, uh, and then I didn't exactly intend to have them I mean, his face is a surprise because eventually, you know, one of the one of the animal just run in the wife, you know, uh, a ram starting to run in the wife, and I mean, she was just, you know, caught off sur by surprise and you know starting to cry, and then the light was starting to go down and over it, where it would be almost impossible, and you can see his face shouldn't have been like that. I mean, I didn't to intend to have it like that. And, uh, uh, and you know, there was maybe, you know, it was, it was taken really already when the sun was over, but far over, and because of technical reasons, it almost couldn't happen, and then, uh, and I remember my assistant, the, <laughs> the flock started to run from each side, so he had to bring them together, and uh, so this is, the, I mean, this is the, the, the anecdote, but which make, which make the photograph. What I love about that story is that what you caught in his face is his protectiveness, right, of his wife, she's just been hurt, He's ready to just abandon the project. Let's get out. This is something about this doesn't feel right. He's protective. He's upset about her. Um, but in, if we didn't know that story, which we couldn't possibly know, looking at it, we see a story that perhaps you would want to tell about him, which is this fierce protectiveness of this place, this land, right, which is his yes. and, and nobody else's, and which he will, and all of that is in the face, but how you arrived at it was a, a, a both the, the marriage of accident and your vision and his emotionality. I mean, to create a photograph is basically to plan everything that can be planned, you know, 100%, 190%, but to always leave some space for something to erupt. If not, there's no photograph. Isn't it always the, the accident that leads one to the, to the best moment in one's world? Yes, yes. So this is very, this very, very thin line. And, uh, but I mean, when I look at the photograph, I really have a feeling that, you know, this could be one of the zealots of, uh, you know, Bar, uh, of the time of Bar Korba, or yeah. that's what comes to my mind. But again, I believe, you know, creating an image, a good image is an image where enough space is left for the viewer to start his or own, you know, uh, storytelling, his own, uh, his own journey. Mm. It, the, the early photographs we looked at of the family and the Palace Hotel are much more, a much more limited palette. And it, it, you can see you're moving from black and white into color, but the color here to me is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I wonder whether you, fe over the course of taking these, I don't know where in the project this photograph is, but whether in the course of that you Be began to sort of embrace color more or... Yes, yes, but when you look at the images, they are really, there's, I'm still the person who photographed in black and white all my life, and it's like black and white, but it's, it, it's color, but it's very monochromatic. You know, the intervals are very little mm -hmm. with the, and, uh, and then I discovered that while I was photographing, uh, because, you know, something deeper in me photographed than my will, and there's this kind, so at the end I find this kind of faithfulness to black and white. Mm -hmm. I just go back to that one photograph that I skipped because I love it and I don't want to leave it. Um, one of the interesting things about you participating in this project, which you weren't sure that you would do, right? I was sure at the beginning I would do it myself. And then while spending a lot of time becoming the conductor uh, by necessity of this big symphonic orchestra, and making sure that everybody will play it according to its score, but most important, everybody would play together, which we only feel when we see the show now. I mean, we only, Matt and I, understood that we really got this orchestra to play when we saw it for the first time on the walls, you know, when it started in Prague. Mm -hmm. Well, my, what I was going to say is that you are unique among this group in, in your 
the, your relationship with this play, with Israel, and it goes very, very far back from you to the point where you are the only photographer here who could photograph neighbors. Yes, these are your neighbors, right? And so that you're, 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 you're coming at it from a slightly different uh, perspective, uh, a closer one, but also, of course, uh, somebody who um, has always moved back and forth between Israel and, and um, the rest of the world. The, you told me a wonderful story about these people, which maybe you could share with the audience. Yeah, I mean, they are my neighbors, and uh, usually on uh, Shabbat, I see them coming, going out, you know, during the uh, starting in May, and they, they go with an umbrella. The second person on the left has an umbrella, and they go to the beach, and uh, I try to make the photograph, I, I try to take this photograph in their home. I wanted a family portrait. Uh, but the home was far too small. I didn't have enough recul, and I couldn't make, take this photograph. And I say, so let's try to go to see where they are going. And then I explored several places uh, where you know, I could make the photograph. And, uh, and then uh, you know, they were, the, the children are already working, so you know, it's a big uh, undertaking. And, I wanted the weather to be to be good enough, and the weather was like you know the gift that life makes you. Uh, you know, as Marie Bonaparte says, uh, work is easy. What is truly difficult is grace. And so here I was, and uh, this incredible you know uh, overcast sky, no projected shadow, and. And it was very important for me, it was late in the project, and I really didn't have any Oriental family. I had mainly white Ashkenazim, <laughs> and I really wanted to have, I mean, I, have it, I, I photograph Ethiopians, and that, but I really wanted to have, you know, a middle-class family. Uh, uh, his father came from, uh, from Ur in Chaldea, Ur Kazdim, uh, in, uh, in the late 30s and uh, with a donkey, uh, and just, you know, this is part of the journey that I want to tell. It's not here, but there's maybe somewhere it is here, or at least in my desire to, to have somewhere in the photograph an evocation of that, and she's uh, parents came from Morocco. And, uh, but I, as I may have told you before, this is my waiting for Godot. Uh, you know, where are they coming from? Where are they going? And um, I think that's somehow made one has that feeling of the and the eternal sense of waiting, partly because you caught it at this moment where there are no shadows. I've talked to you about this that we, mm. we don't see there's no presence of time that if we had the shadows there, we would feel that. But there is something some they are in this uh, place void of any reference to anything else. Um, but we can only judge by what they've brought with them. Um, yeah, you don't see, I mean, I could have chosen another vantage point and then we would see more of the behind and there's just sand. And of course, the symbolism of sand, yeah. but also there's a road that you can see, you know, how the, the sand took over. And maybe sand, I wanted sand because there's hardly uh, any dunes left in Israel. The, the immigration uh, in the early 90s of uh, Russian population, the entire coast has been, you know, built all along, you know, from Tel Aviv to Ashdod, Ashkelon, uh, and uh, so I, I wanted to have the presence of sand for whatever I, reason. I think also of the story you told me about um, the presence of sand in trying to print these photographs, that, there, that early on when you tried to print the palace photograph, and was it Thomas Truth's photograph, that there was sand <laughs> oh yeah, we, we, we wanted to, to organize, you know, to, to have photographers process their film in Israel. And we had a very good lab, but okay. after, you know, after the first two months, and uh, people like Thomas Truss had given, had trusted me, and, uh, and, and my negative, his negatives were, were basically scratched with uh, particle of sands which were, and then from that, you know, we decided to send the work first in London, and then, you know, he did it himself in Dusseldorf, and uh, some did it in New York, and uh, yes. Mm. 
<laughs> yes, this is, you know, Jerusalem is really the threshold of the desert and... Uh, <laughs> mm. yeah. The other thing that I love about this photograph is um, the sense of how each of these people have chosen their space apart from each other. And you have this family portrait where it's, again, this sort of beautiful choreography of their relationships. But you told me they sort of, you asked them to assemble themselves and this is how they decide, this is how they fell out. Yeah, I usually believe that people know to invest a space where they, that they know better than I. I may change a little, you know, move a little for, you know, uh, the consideration plastic uh, for, you know, graphical uh, uh, consideration. But I try, I let them first take the initial uh, position. Mm. Um, let's go to, let's see, the last photograph. Um. This is the one on which I could spend an hour. So this is good because I'm sure somebody will show us, you know, a little panel, five minutes, I say, I will not look at your panel. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're getting the five minutes sign, but, I, but there is a lot to say about this, and yeah. I want you to, to talk about it, but what really one of the things I felt constantly in looking at your photographs um, and talking to you is something I think about a lot in my own work, which is the limitations of our medium, the struggle against um, what, what we want our work to say, but we can't, it's impossible for it to say. For me, one of the limitations of being a writer is having to work um, in solitude. I always envy my friends like you or choreographers who can collaborate with other people and what the richness that that brings into the work. For me, I can go out into the world, but at the end of the day, it's, it is always only me alone trying to produce the work. For you, one of the limitations which I find comes up a lot when you talk about your work is the, um, the, the inability to tell, literally tell so much of the story, which is also the beauty of the work, that, you, that it is left, that the, the photograph has to carry the weight and some, some things will, will not be transmitted and many things will, some things you don't expect to be transmitted. Will. But the, with each of these photographs, when I walked around the gallery with you, I had the writerly instinct, which is not the photographer's instinct. You say, oh, but the rest of the story, the rest of the story is so good, and how can you resist, you know, and how can you live with the rest of the story not being told? Or, uh, and this photograph um, has a very rich story, which I'd like you to talk about. And, and you called it, uh, I think in your, um, in your interview in the, the, book, the book of uh, the show, which was with the curator, right? Mm -hmm, yes. Um, I think, let's see if I can find what you said about it. Um, you, that it's a photograph, it's one that you love and has many layers, but it fails ultimately to express what you intended to say. Um, and I wanted to say, I sort of, not necessarily end with the notion of failure, but maybe that's not a bad place to end since you're also in the nesting state of thinking about the next work. And I think generally as an artist, one, one moves from failure to failure. Uh, I, this is a very important photograph. Uh, my assistant uh, who was here a few days ago uh, is part of, a, was a former member of the kibbutz Magan Michael, uh, kibbutz in the north, one of the, the richest kibbutz in Israel. Uh, and uh, and I wanted to have, I, up until the very end of my project, the kibbutz was not represented. And I said, I want an image of the kibbutz. So we went to the kibbutz, and uh, I met with the person who ran the, the local newspaper. And um, she turned to be uh, uh, one of the la she was part of the last class uh, in those children home, Bate Yeladim. Uh, which uh, uh, which closed uh, uh, basically with this person who is today 40. So when she was, you know, up until she was 13 or 15, uh, those this institution which has defined the kibbutz, basically those uh, children uh, home uh, within the kibbutz uh, were created because of necessity. Uh, they were there was no money, it was easier for parents to, to, uh, to have their children 
together in a home and raised by you know a uh, few few member of the kibbutz and the parents could visit them one hour a day from four to five and they would sleep together they would i mean basically and uh, but very quickly what what came out of a necessity uh, became an ideological uh, component of this uh, of and part or you know of this uh, zionist uh, dream except that for many of them it became a nightmare and you have today a generation of people who were in those uh, children home not all but a part of this population who are still you know uh, living after the trauma of this uh, this institution uh, and people i have maybe some of the most poignant um, reci account mm -hmm. of their journey and children today uh, are asking why did our parents give us away uh, they speak of eternal longing uh, something incredible and among the those uh, those four women here who are about 40 the woman here on the right uh, was the one who made the entire uh, institution of the children home collapse uh, she was four years old, and she ran at night under under the uh, under the rain. And she described. I mean, this is. I made a little film uh, while being with them, and it was just poignant. And I spent about six months meeting with these women. So basically, one woman, Shlomit, in the uh, the second on the left, uh, who is the uh, running the newspaper. Uh, took uh, introduced me to few others, and I had six months. I wanted a photograph with five women because I believe that I believe that an uneven number provide a better construction of image. And the fifth person who was called by their her friend the fortress never accepted. While I thought I could get her to accept, and then I ended up speaking with a woman in Munich who was in fact the souffre douleur, I don't know how you call that, uh, uh, the person who was like bullied by the four others. And I had long conversation with them, but the entire idea was to photograph four women who have been sacrificed on the altar of Zionist socialist ideology. And those are their words. Uh, and and it was a, an incredible journey. I both met with them extensively, uh, each of them separately and together. And one day I say, let's, let's spend a full day together and we'll make a photograph. And so we are, I arrived early in the morning uh, and we had a wonderful breakfast. And then, of course, I had an idea of where I would take the photograph. But, uh, but uh, I went there and there was something which was not happening as I thought it would happen. And we went back home and then, you know, we were already the time of the lunch. I had planned also a photograph for the sunset going in a boat in the middle because they live in an incredible bay. This is the most beautiful beach of Israel. So there's a, this is the best, uh, best uh, kept secret. There's a beach in Magad Michael. Everybody can go. And this is the most beautiful beach of Israel. There's nobody. Uh, and you can go there when you go to Israel. And so, but we didn't get to this photograph because the, the, we run late. And around lunch, they started to sit on the, on the sofa. And they were looking at photographs uh, because I basically wanted to photograph uh, their inner self. I wanted to photograph this inner space. I wanted to photograph, you know, something of their soul, something of the trauma and that. And then what happened was so beautiful. I told my assistant, let's move all the, because the, the camera was not here. I had not planned to use a flash or that. And we moved there. And I, you know, I had 20 photographs. So, I mean, at that time, I had only left, I think, eight photographs because of what I did previously. And so I'm, I'm, rem I'm remembering now one of the, 
uh, one of the words because we speak of failure. This photograph is a story of a failure. But among the many people who took part in this informal think tank, which informed me and many of the photographers who met with them, there was Miron Benvenisti, a kind of uh, uh, iconic figure, historian in Israel. And, and he said at some point, he said, and what if Israel would be a triumphal failure? And uh, do we judge, you know, an experiment uh, with the result? And uh, I think, and what, what is admirable, we all wanted to uh, testify on this, you know, how those people have been sacrificed on the altar of an ideology. This is what they wanted, this is what I wanted, so we were, and what happened in this photograph is like you see those incredible plants which have grown. You can see the feet, you can see the present, you can see life. You see nothing of those, you know, uh, of those sacrificed people as they, they experience it like that. And it makes me think of this very famous uh, um, say of uh, Beckett. I think it's ever lost, ever failed, fail again, fail better. Fail better, yeah. I have a poster of that on my wall. Ah. Um, <laughs> right before we came on stage, Frederick read the truly brilliant review that just came out in the New York Times of this exhibition, Mazel Tov. Thank you. And I wonder, just, we're going to be booted off the stage in a minute, but I wonder, after all of this, I'm exhausted even thinking about this project, 600 photographs, 12 photographers, the years and years of effort and thought that went into this. What are you going to do next? You should ask next what he is going to, what what next want to do with me. What, ne what next will do for you? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Quickly, I'd like to let everybody know that we'll continue um, the second in this series of four conversations between this place artists and writers um, on Thursday, March 31st at 7 p.m. We'll have um, photographer Stephen Shore speaking to historian Ian Baruma. I hope you'll be able to join us, thanks.